the complexity of how a buck is zigzagging on the landscape, the term for that is tortuosity. Um, no way so, I was going to remember yeah. that word. <laughs> say, say that. Torch, tortuo- tortuosity. Yeah. That, I'm not even going to yeah. say it, Jacob. No, no way. <laughs> Absolutely not. I'm good. Torch. Um, so it, it, if it's a straight line, then it is not tortuous. Okay. So I don't know where we come up with those words, but that that's <laughs> the word we use. Or blame it as Latin for something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we could call it complexity. Okay. How about that? Um, so, yeah, for, for that, we looked at, um, of, course, of course, there was a lot of different ways we looked at it, but there was a, a difference in the total distance that a buck moves. And so I think the way we expressed that in, in the paper was uh, a buck could move a mile a day but it may not be moving very far from where it started, let's say at midnight to go to midnight the next day in a 24 hour period. The, the distance of where the buck started and where the buck ended and that distance we call net displacement. So it is moved to a completely different area. The more tortuous the pathway, the more close that net displacement displacement value is going to be i got you so he might his caller may record that he moved 2500 yards today but from point a to point b he only moved like 800 yards that's right gotcha that's okay. right and so those are more of your that's more of your he's zigzagging around he's staying in a pretty tight area and while he's moving a lot it's not like he's covering miles and like moving out of an area correct with the exception of excursions correct okay um one th- thing y- y- y'all may have heard me talking about this i mean there's so many little interesting facets here to talk about but one of them that really stuck with me and i'm probably a weirdo but this is really important to me was you've heard all the time and you probably did that with the, the auburn data is that we will do annual home ranges mm-hmm. that's the most common you see it reported an annual home range or a seasonal home range meaning fall or the hunting season, we calculated daily home ranges. So, and so I'm thinking about this from a hunting perspective. So on any given day, how much area is this buck going to be using? And it was remarkably consistent that if it was outside the hunting season or the pre-rut or the post-rut, the daily home range of a buck was 200 acres. Now, when you combine that with that net displacement stuff, we notice that when you are outside of the rut, a buck is still using 200 acres a day, but there's a tremendous amount of overlap in those little 200 acre polygons, okay? So they might be you know, using a larger acreage over a month, but every day it's 200 acres, but there's 50% overlap from Tuesday to Wednesday of the next 200 acres. But then when you get to the rut, they're still using 200 acres a day, but now the net displacement, those 200 acre polygons are further apart. And I'm using my hands, I know. No, no, it's okay for video. <laughs> video. You, better, you better go to YouTube, baby. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, yeah. But th- that's super. So that was that consistent kind of across the board for most bucks? Um. Well, we, we calculated a population okay. average, okay. so I'm sure there were There's individual fluctuate. differences. Okay. But. Number one, one, one factor uh, I want to talk about with like this 200 acre kind of daily use for a buck on average, how how much is habitat and forage availability a factor for that size? Like, do you think that would relate to everywhere, or just kind of based off the test sites and the sites that you're looking at right now? Yeah. I, I, I cannot say that would hold in West Virginia or would hold in North Texas. I, th- I think that is very, very landscape dependent. And so you, c- you can easily imagine that if your resources are more sparse and spread out, then it's probably not 200 acres. It might be 500 acres. Mm-hmm. But in the context here, it was about 200 acres. Now, in areas with even more, I'm just thinking in areas with even well, I mean, it seems like y'all have a ton of food on this property, like forage, different forage species and everything available. But I kind of go back to like clear cut country. You know, if he's got three different age clear cuts, like one that's a year old, that's got all this fresh growth. He's got one that's, you know, two, three years old. He's got one that's five, six years old that maybe he's just kind of more bedding, or jumping around from bedding locations. And then also like a creek, couple creek bombs there and everything else. I can almost imagine it could be 
potentially even smaller during certain points of the year. Because, I mean, there, you have so much going on in one of those areas. But that is super interesting. Let me ask you, as a hunter, what does that mean for you, knowing that data, if you have trail cameras out and you're catching buck, like a specific buck on camera, are you is that something that you're kind of processing in the back of your mind of like, how is he using this area based off how frequently I'm getting him on camera, what other cameras I'm getting him on in order to try to get a bigger picture of exactly how he's using the landscape and how much he's using during specific days? Well, let me tell you the the way I think about it and the way I wish I could apply it if I had a bunch of time to do it and and the hunting property was set up is I tend to think and, you know, and I even think about habitat management in this regard now as well is looking at in 200 or 300 or 400 acre blocks on a landscape is in this 300 acres, where's the most likely cover spots going to be? Where is most likely the foraging spots going to be? If I own the land or I'm advising someone on the land, if I see a big gap there, having this knowledge is we need some cover in this area. Uh, and so then I'm just thinking, all right, how could I, how could I maximize my odds? It would be, uh, let's just say that we did have a nice grid of two to 300 acre spots on the landscape. And we do have very definable, these are cover patches. Here's a cover patch. Here's a cover patch. I'm thinking I'm increasing my odds looking for corridors in between those cover patches. And I might have to sit there for two days. I might have to sit there for two weeks, but I think eventually you're going to have a circuit of where that buck is going to go through there, hopefully during daylight hours. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah, that's something that I wanted to end up getting into is those circuits or uh, travel corridors specifically, and if there's any kind of anything that you found of how bucks are using the landscape to travel um, and, and avoid people, hopefully, or if they if they're just like choose one thing over another. What is your thought process on that when you have like the variability in some of these different areas of these states that have, you know, rut time frames that are, you know, different, you know, maybe by a month or more? Um, how do you think that would affect a hunter or maybe you have some personal experience with that or maybe data on those deer specifically using more of those tighter, thicker locations based off hunting pressure, but also lack of cover because it's later in the season? Yeah, I, I would think it w- it is mostly a function of hunting pressure. Um, and, and I think you've got an interaction there as well. So I would say if, if you had uh, a less amount of cover, but no hunting pressure, probably not a big difference. But when you couple those two together, it's probably the worst case scenario, right? Yeah. Um, uh, another thing, uh, our, our current analyst Natasha did that was just a very clear and and obvious effect of hunting pressure in a way that would be very tangible for hunters is that um, hunting food plots. And I I don't know about y'all in Alabama, but but in Mississippi, uh, hunters spend a lot of time hunting food plots. Oh yeah, yeah. you should come to my club. <laughs> <laughs> there, there ain't a there ain't a yearling safe on those food no. plots. <laughs> what uh, our analyst name is Natasha. What what Natasha did was looking at from these collared bucks, the same population we're talking about, the entry time. So when they go to a food plot in the afternoon. What time are they entering the plot relative to sunset? And month by month, week by week, it gets later and later and later, such that when you're in bow season, you got those bucks entering that food plot easily an hour before sunset. The time when we typically start expect, expecting to see deer, mm-hmm. you know, the does are coming out and then you're hoping the buck, you know, all that's completely normal. But then as time goes by over the season, then it goes from an hour before to 30 minutes before to right at sunset. And then when you get to that last month, the deer season in this study area, they're coming to the plot an hour after sunset. And that, that's just all hunting pressure. That yeah. is just habitually them coming and either, even if there's no gunshots, mm-hmm. but they're detecting that, that you're there and they're changing their behavior. Now, do you think that's something that would translate outside of just food plots? Like that could also easily be your little SMZ creek drainage that's got three or four white oaks in it that some people have been hunting. Could it translate like that? Absolutely. 
Yeah. I, I can't prove that with our data, but I don't see why that mechanism would be mm-hmm. any different. Okay. I mean, it's just disturbance at a particular place, and the deer are learning. When I go there, I keep smelling humans, yep. mm-hmm. and so I'm going to go at a different time. Yeah, that that makes perfect sense, and I, like I feel like you see that a lot with feeders too. Well, and right? that's yeah. where I think a lot of guys burn themselves because you see this on Facebook all the time. We're talking about Facebook earlier before we start recording. People are like, "I've got this big buck coming to a feeder. I've got him on camera two hours after dark. I'm going to go and hunt him." And it's like you're going to make it so much worse. Like maybe you haven't hunted quite yet, but once you start going in there, he knows you're there. If you only have a small little area that you're hunting, or you're, there's so many people, it seems like they want to hunt right on top of their cameras. Yeah, it's like they get a buck on camera. I'm sitting right there. Like I'm not trying to figure out point of travel, like where he's coming from or where is he going to try to cut the distance in order to try to get him during daylight hours. And um, I feel like that probably burns so many people. But then again, Andrew's Club's a great example. A lot of guys hunting. I mean, 95, 98 percent of the people in his club are hunting food plots all year. But every now and then, someone will get lucky. And you know, president of the club killed a really nice mature yeah. buck on a food plot that was probably worn out, and it just happened to be the day that buck wanted to go from one clear-cut bedding area to another clear-cut bedding area across a power line on that food on that food plot. Got and killed he, at like 6 a.m. And he got right, ha- right and he, at first light, and he, he was crossing it. And he, and he got hammered, but... Yeah, he done good. Um, he was uh, hanging out with his girlfriend too late. Yeah, <laughs> but but that, that is interesting, kind of seeing like the data Natasha was looking at and kind of seeing how it kind of, as the, the months went on, it got later and later mm-hmm. and later, mm-hmm. uh, which kind of makes you think, you know, it's one thing when you're on private land, especially if it's like a you own the property, you can kind of control who's hunting, when they're hunting, all that kind of stuff. And maybe you kind of, like I've heard of some like really nice clubs that, you know, they, during the rut, like before the rut, during the rut, they're not, uh, you can't shoot does on, on food plots or they have stands set up where you're, it's specifically for gun hunting where you're way off a of food plot, you know, hopefully with a good wind where deer should never know you're even in the general area to come out to a food plot. But I hunt mostly public land. Andrew's now hunting some private land. Doesn't hunt public land a whole bunch anymore now. Easy. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's a little bit different uh, scenario. I don't hunt food plots on private land, but or on public land, I mean. Um, but, you know, where I see like that pressure difference, like what you mentioned, it's got to be directly related to pressure because you'll go to state park where you can't hunt and there'll be deer in wide open hardwoods that you see 300 yards through. They don't care. And Absolutely. Bed down in it the whole nine yards. Um, but again, in some of these areas that that they rut later in the season, there's been so much pressure and guys getting out there trying to find a deer, and it's like they just get sucked tight and they're very, very aware of what's going on. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's super I complete, interesting. I completely agree. 